Hello and welcome to this video on childhood, inequality, the future of childhood and the new sociology of childhood. March of progress sociologists argue adults use their power to protect children, whereas conflict sociologists argue that this power is used to oppress children. Protection is therefore a form of oppression. So it may be that adults are, yes, they're looking to protect their children, but in doing so, they are controlling them and actually often taking decisions away from them, or so conflict sociologists would argue. Shula Mathiasen, there she is in the top left-hand corner, argued that child labour laws actually segregate children, keep them dependent on adults, and keep them subject to adult control. So because children can't earn, because they are economically irrelevant to an extent, and this means that they cannot make their own decisions about what they want to do, where they want to go, and these sorts of things. And instead, therefore, they are completely reliant upon their parents or their guardians who are providing the money they need to survive. And so in that sense, this support is almost a form of oppression. We're going to look at a range of different ways adults control children's space, children's bodies, children's time, and children's access to resources. So in terms of the way children's space is controlled by adults, there's a range of different examples here. So children's movements in life are limited. So between the age of zero up until the age of, let's say, at least 18, although sometimes earlier, depending on when people gain their independence, we find that children's movements are limited by adults, in particular their parents. So you may have, for example, when you were younger, attempted to go into a newsagent, perhaps to buy yourself a drink or something to eat after school. And because you had your uniform on, you may have been stopped because there may have been a sign on the front door saying no more than two school children to enter any one time. And this is because adults who are running their business may not trust children and may think they're likely to be shoplifters, which is arguably unfair. Next, the use of CCTV in public spaces tends to be in places where young people congregate. So often in places in local towns and cities will have CCTV in areas where they think young people will congregate in a view to try and prevent them perhaps from doing anything that might be considered antisocial or even just to prevent them from hanging out there at all. We also find that the police and community support officers have the powers of dispersal and curfew, which means they can tell young people to disperse if they're in a large group and they have to go separate ways or separate directions. And also after, I believe it's about 10, 13 or 11 o'clock, people below the age of 18 are supposed to be home and under the supervision of their guardian or parent. And so in that sense, there is a curfew for young people. Also, the road safety rules and stranger danger advice that we are given as young people uh, actually acts as a way of you know, preventing perhaps young people from engaging in conversations or relationships with people they don't know. They, in many ways, it's trying to limit their interactions with people who are different from themselves or who are strangers or who they don't know yet. And so it's confining who they can talk to to people they meet at school or people in their family. Children are shepherded to and from school increasingly. We actually find that many parents are deciding not to allow their children to either walk or to cycle or to get the bus or train to school they'd rather take them themselves in a car and pick them up themselves and they say they're doing it often out of the view of it being more safe but actually it could be a form of control and in this sense children's liberty is curtailed next we need to consider ways in which adults control children's bodies so adults will tell children to sit down and to not run but instead to walk sensibly adults will decide how children style their hair and when they get it cut Adults will decide if children can have their ears pierced or other parts of their bodies pierced or indeed if they can have tattoos. Adults and in particular parents and guardians have the monopoly on touching children, washing children, deciding what they eat and deciding how they dress. Adults will pat children's heads, will stroke their hair, will hold their hands, will pick them up, will cuddle and kiss them, often without asking children for permission. Adults will decide if they're going to physically discipline, that is to say they're going to smack or slap or spank children if they've been naughty. And adults will tell children not to pick their nose, not to suck their thumb, not to bite their nails, not to masturbate and to not engage in sexual relations. And again, these are all ways in which adults are controlling children's bodies, even though the children arguably should have complete freedom and liberty over their bodies and what they do to them. We need to consider ways in which adults control children's time. So adults control children's daily routines. From Monday to Friday, for most children, that's going to be waking up, getting washed, getting dressed, having breakfast, going to school, and then... Whilst in school, an adult, a teacher, is going to decide how the children spend their time. 
then the adults, the parents are going to pick the children up from school most likely and are then going to work out how they're going to spend their evenings. Do they do a hobby? Do they do their homework? What time do they have dinner? When do they go to bed? And that process continues all week. And at the weekends, usually children are under adult supervision. So adults control children's daily routines and adults also control children's speed of growing up. They control their access to certain resources. So think of here, everything from films and movies to TV programs to internet and different websites on the internet sometimes these are blocked by different parental control settings so adults are actually controlling children's access to information the information that may lead them to grow up or become more adult we need to consider ways in which adults control children's access to resources so children have a limited ability to earn money in that sense they are completely dependent on their adults their, their parents or guardians Labour laws mean that children essentially cannot work, it's almost impossible, and the fact that children are in compulsory schooling until 18, again, compounds this issue. Child benefit, as it first existed or used to exist, used to be paid to the mother. Now, child benefit is changing, but still the money will be paid to adults, not to the children. We used to have education and maintenance allowance, but this has been cut, been cut uh, in favour of a reduced learning skills fund, which very few young people can access, but again, that's adults, that's politicians, that's social workers and so on, deciding when young people can access money. Pocket money is often tightly controlled and there's often restrictions on what it can be spent on, what it cannot be spent on, when it can be spent, how much it can be spent and how it is earned. So sometimes parents will say, well, you need to do the chores before you get your pocket money. Finally, we need to consider ways in which adults control children and we need to think about the element of neglect and abuse here. So tens of thousands of children are physically, sexually, psychologically or emotionally abused by adults every year. This in effect is the dark side of family life, very similar to domestic abuse as we looked at previously when we considered couples. And the situation is some parents will use neglect and abuse as a way of controlling their children. That is the, the dark reality of some families. In terms of the future of childhood, as sociologists, we realise that children are gaining more and more power in terms of their rights. This leads to a breakdown in the distinction between and difference between adults and children. And you may want to consider these two questions and jot down some ideas. Is childhood in Western society disappearing? How could you argue that within society today, the notion of childhood is disappearing? What examples can you think of? And you may want to take one example such as clothing. How is the distinction in clothing broken down between adults and children? As I think you'll find there's many pieces of clothing now that both adults and children wear. Take a moment and pause the video now, jot down some ideas. Neil Postman argues that childhood is disappearing at a dazzling speed. Children have the same rights as adults. There are now similarities in forms of clothing. Children are committing adult crimes and children are increasingly being left unsupervised by adults. The emergence and now disappearance of childhood is due to the rise and fall of print culture and it's replaced by television culture. So historically, prior to the point where we had a print press and people could read en masse, adults had access to the adult word, world simply by virtue of being able to talk and to understand the language. Once the print press came about and mass education began, we actually started to find that, to be honest, certain things could be hid away from children in a printed book. So this was a way of hiding away the adult parts of the world or the more darker parts of the world from children who then got to enjoy their age of innocence. With the rise of television and now the internet, however, and indeed smartphones, which young people seem to have from a very young age, we find that adults, or sorry, children are now able to access this information far earlier and therefore are accessing you know, adult concepts far earlier. And this is perhaps leading to the disappearance of childhood. So the views examined so far see childhood as socially constructed, something created by society. These views take an adultist perspective, according to Mayo, there she is in the top right hand corner, where we see children as passive socialization projects. So it's that idea again, that some sociologists believe that children are almost born as a blank slate or a tabula rasa and that adults socialise them and write upon that slate everything they need to know and then that's how they become the adults they will be. The new sociology, however, seeks to see children as active agents in their own lives rather than adults in waiting. So it actually sort of says well, when they're born, yes, they're being socialised, but they do have elements of their own ideas. They will have their own views on things. They will have their own opinions. And that this means that children are active in their own socialisation, not simply passive. Smart argues that sociologists need to consider the views and experiences of children. Whilst Mason and Tipper found in their research that children define 
family differently, that they didn't conform to adult ideas. So their ideas of what a family is is actually quite different. Often they were more likely to say that things like uh, the pets were part of the family, or even family friends were part of the family, or possibly even neighbours or good close personal friends of themselves. So they actually saw family in a far broader sense than the very narrow adult ways that perhaps we tend to use in sociology and in society generally. Smart and others found that children were not passive during divorce situations, that they actively tried to help. And so when the divorce was happening, it wasn't happening to them. They were trying to take part in it, perhaps trying to comfort their parents, perhaps trying to almost find a way for them to reconcile themselves, possibly. It is therefore best to use open-ended questions in informal, unstructured interviews if we're going to be working with children to discover more about children, as this allows children to express themselves in more detail. It helps sociologists to understand the plurality of childhoods that exist and make sure that we realise that childhood isn't a, a single experience that happens to everyone in the same way. In fact, it's very, very different uh, for every single child in all parts of not only British or Western society, but the world over. And it helps to draw attention to the relative powerlessness of children. The fact is, you know, they do not have the power that adults do, that things are happening to them, although they are trying to perhaps engage with it as much as they possibly can. That's it. Thank you very much.